Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to Zen Pityo course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are looking at James Joyce's novel Ulysses. So in this particular section we talk about the uh, very interesting mixture of flippancy and profundity in this novel, uh, especially when it comes to machines. So we look at the relationship between the metaphysical understanding of mortality, immortality and a very flippant material understanding of the same issues at hand. And the section that we look at today is obviously, I mean this is set in a graveyard, this is a funeral ceremony which is taking place. Well, Leopold Bloom is attending uh, and then you know he's having a chain of thoughts in his mind. Uh, thoughts range from mortality to machines to flippancy to different kinds of sentiments which are very interestingly uh, mingling with each other and very curious combinations. So as I mentioned already in one of my previous lectures about Ulysses, uh, there is a lot of stream of consciousness in this novel but then at the same time it is not entirely about a profound epiphany, it is not entirely about mystic epiphany. The mysticism and the profundity of these emotional experiences are always mediated uh, to a very flippant uh, material markers. And the material markers are very vulgar in quality, they are very earthly in quality, they are very immediate and local in quality. And the vulgarity, the immediate quality, the automatism of these markers, it does not really belie the metaphysical profundity of thoughts but actually accentuates it and at the same time complicates it. So how does, how do you human beings, we human beings think in terms of our negotiation with machines? Uh, how can machines help us uh, not to bring us down, not to reduce us into uh, different forms but also to accentuate us as human beings. Uh, so this whole engagement with machines becomes a very important uh, issue in modernism in particular. But if you take a look at, I mean we have already talked about Eliot's Wasteland and also some of his early poetry, we have seen already how machines uh, become a very recursive feature uh, in those kinds of poems where the entire idea about consciousness, memory, thought processes, they become mediated and marked by machines. And the marking of machines become very, very important and in this section we will find out you know, exactly how Joyce does in this novel. So we have things about, we have uh, sentiments about mortality, immortality, uh, you know the fact that everyone is going to die, uh, imminent death in Dublin and then all these uh, sort of mixed together and they inform different kinds of other sentiments through certain machinic markers. The gramophone being a very interesting metaphor of machines over here. Okay, so this is being gazed at by Leopold Bloom. Uh, this should be on the screen. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch like stuffed that the wedding present uh, Alderman Hooper gave us, who, not a budge out of him, knows there are no catapults to let fly at him, dead animals even sadder, silly merely burying the little bird, dead bird in the kitchen matchbox, a daisy chain and bits of broken chainies on the grave. The sacred heart that is, uh, showing it, heart on his sleeve, ought to be sideways and read it should be painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it or whatever that. Seems anything but please, why this infliction? Would birds come back and then peck like the boy with a basket of fruit? But he said no, because they ought to have been afraid of the boy, Apollo that was. How many, for these here once walked around Dublin, faithful departed, as you are now, so once were we, right? So uh, this almost becomes a swan stable uh, and he sees a little bird on the, on the, on the branch. And he knows the bird is very certain of his, uh, you know, life at the moment because there's more no catapults thrown at him or, or it. And the references of dead birds, dead animals around as well. Uh, and it, it suddenly becomes very spectral in quality. So it's almost like dead people, dead animals, dead organisms having voices of their own and speaking with the living people uh, at this point of time. So it becomes a swan stable like sequence with the dead speaking with the non dead. Uh, besides, how could you remember everybody? Eyes, walk, voice. Well, the voice, yes, gramophone, and this becomes an interesting bit where machines come in as a marker of memory, right? And you know, memory becomes mediated through machines, so the materialization of machines. So machines become the material markers, material reservers, material containers of memory, as it were. W yeah, well, the voice, yes, gramophone. Have a gramophone in every grave and keep it in the house. Uh, after, after dinner on a Sunday, put on poor old great grandfather. Crap, hello, 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 I'm awfully glad, crack, awfully glad, see again, hello, hello, awful, shush. 
remind you of the voice like the photograph reminds you of the face. Otherwise, you cannot remember the face after 15 years, say. For instance, here, for instance, some fellow that died when I was in Wisdom Hellies. Now, so the gramophone and the photograph away are the emerges uh, interesting preservers of memory. Uh, so, you know, these become uh, acts of self-preservation to a certain extent. Uh, so again, this is something which we saw in Eliot's early poetry as well, especially in the wasteland where the gramophone had appeared uh, as a marker of automatism, as a marker of numbness, so to say. If you remember that um, scene where the typist, uh, you, know, you know, she puts a, a, a new record on the gramophone where her automatic hand moves towards the gramophone and a half thought passes through her brains. That obviously became a, a metaphor of numbness, a metaphor of stillness. Uh, which was part of the dehumanization that Wasteland was depicting and dramatizing. Now, obviously, over here, it is more uh, carnivalesque in quality. By carnivalesque, I mean it's more playful in quality. So, Bloom over here uh, is having an epiphany about mortality and immortality. Uh, and he realizes that one way of preserving memory, one way of preserving the voice is from the gramophone, just like uh, the photograph is a preserver of images, preserver of faces. So, that becomes an interesting, uh, you know, marker of preservation, self-preservation, etc. So again, what we have here is a very interesting entanglement, as it were, between something material, something earthly, something flippant, and then something metaphysical, such as memory. And if you remember, this can be connected to uh, some of the early discussions we had, especially in the last lecture, where the whole idea of metempsychosis, uh, where and Bloom and, uh, Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom are talking about the entire transmigration of the soul, how uh, the soul actually passes in one body to another body, and so it never really dies, uh, how that was immediately interrupted and how that entire sequence cut into the overcooked kidney or the kidney was being transformed into something overcooked and we saw how uh, the very spiritual metaphysical understanding of migration uh, was very quickly um, you know aligned with a very interesting uh, culinary migration that was taking place with the, with the burnt kidney which is almost inedible in quality by the time uh, Bloom managed to rescue it from the stove. Okay. He looked down intently into a stone crypt some animal wait there he goes. An obese grey cat toddled along the side of the crypt, moving the pebbles, an old stager, grey grandfather. He, knew, he knows the ropes. The grey alive crushed itself in under the plinth, wriggled itself in under it, good hiding place, a hiding place for treasure. Who lives here? Uh, who lives here? I laid the remains of Robert Emery. Robert Emmett was buried here by torchlight, wasn't he? Making his round. So he, he takes a look at all the graveyards and the graves of different people over here tail gone now. So again, look at the way in which this gaze, which is about dead people, about mortality, about deadness, is being uh, mediated through this very quickly moving mouse. Uh, and this scene reminds me especially of the scene in, in Hamlet, the grave demon scene in Hamlet, where uh, Hamlet, the great uh, procrastinating prince, the philosopher prince, he's uh, ruminating about life, about mortality, about immortality, about language, etc. In a very pseudo-comical way, in a very darkly comic way. And that dark comic quality of the uh, and the graveyard scene in Hamlet is something which is we hear as well uh, as Leopold Bloom takes a uh, look around the graves and, and finds out different connections and is getting interrupted by mice and thoughts about gramophone. Okay, tail gone now. So again, the movement of the mice, the mouse in, in this particular case is very, very important. It's, a very, it's like a shifting signifier of meaning, the tail is gone. One of those chaps would make short walk of a fella, pick the bones clean no matter who it was, ordinary meat for them, a corpse's meat gone bad. So again, uh, this very vulgar and corporeal understanding of uh, the human dead body is interesting over here because on the one hand we have this entire discussion about metempsychosis, about the transmigration of souls, our souls shift from one position to another position and on the other hand we have a description of a corpse, the dead body is meat gone bad. So uh, there is this cannibalistic quality about memory which is being projected over here. So this cannibalism in uh, the thought processes is something which uh, is uh, being talked about. But it becomes something more relevant and something more important as we will see in a, mo in a moment. A corpse is meat gone bad. Well and what is cheese? Corpse and milk. Uh, so again, cheese is something which is seen as a, you know, a marker of nourishment and, and delicacy and taste and human consumption is again connected with rottenness. So rottenness is uh, very much an embedded condition in most human interaction, most human consumption that is something which is being uh, projected over here. Right? So a corpse, a dead body is meat gone bad, uh, cheese is corpse and milk, is milk gone bad, etc. I read in the voyages in China that the Chinese say a white man smells like a corpse. Uh, cremation better, 
frees the dead against it, deviling for the other firm, wholesale burners, the Dutch elven dealers, time of the plague. Uh, so again, the whole idea of cremation becomes uh, interesting because, uh, you know, we have the only hand, the priests are against it, the Catholic priests are against uh, cremation, they are, they obviously, they advocate burial, and then suddenly we're cut into, we, we cut into this whole idea that all come commerce behind cremation. Uh, the Dutch oven dealers, uh, wholesale burners and Dutch oven dealers, uh, time of the plague, Quick lime fever pits to eat them, lethal chamber, ashes to ashes, or bury at sea. Where is the posse tower of silence? Eaten by birds, earth, fire, water. So we have different kinds of uh, images of mortality over here, images of deadness over here, and reference to the Parsi, uh, Parsi tradition or the Zoroastrian tradition of keeping the dead bodies at a tower where birds come and peck at them, that is also being referred to over here. So, we have different kinds of almost uh, carnivalesque uh, description about deadness, about dead bodies, which has obviously been done in a way to talk about mortality in a pseudo comic or pseudo philosophical way. Right. Eaten by birds, earth, fire, water. Drowning, they say, is the pleasantest. See your whole life in a flash. But being brought back to life, no, can't bury in the air, however, out of a flying machine. One that does the news go about whenever a fresh one is let down, underground communication. We learn that from them. Wouldn't be surprised, regular square feed for them. Flies come before uh, he's well dead, got wind of Dignum. They couldn't care about, they wouldn't care about the smell of it. Salt white crumbling mush of cops, smell, tastes like raw white turnips. So again, I mean, look at the constant mingling of the edible and the inedible between the positive and the negative, uh, between uh, the pleasant and the unpleasant and mortality and immortality have been talked about in very flippant terms across the stream of consciousness, random thoughts, processes um, associating one with each other. The whole idea of uh, you know dying and, and, and then wind, the whole idea of being eaten by birds, the whole idea of uh, the crumbling mush of cops which is also smelling, uh, it has a salt white appearance etc. And it tastes like raw white turnips, so you know a corpse tastes like raw white turnips. The gates glimmered in front, still open, back to the world again. So, uh, back to the world again obviously becomes a message of liminality, right. So, the whole idea of uh, shifting between the reverie world and the real world is something which happens uh, across the novel Ulysses. So, that is something which we must never lose sight of. The whole uh, the transitions between the lived world, the, the experienced world and the, uh, the imagined world, the reverie world, the dream world, okay. Back to the world again, enough of this place, bring you a bit nearer every time. Last time I was here was uh, Mr. Sinico's funeral. Poor Papa too, the, the love that kills, and even scrapping of the earth at night with a lantern, like that case I read of uh, two grave, grave stories, give you uh, the creeps after a bit, I will appear to you after death, you will see my ghost after death, my ghost will haunt you after death, there is another world after death nam named hell, I do not like the other world she wrote, no more, th no more do I, plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Uh, feel life uh, and a feel live warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They are not going to get, get me in this innings. Warm beds, warm, full blooded life. So, the whole uh, passage over here becomes an affirmation and an, uh, a demand uh, uh, to, to occupy life, to inhabit life, to experience life, and uh, to get away from any metaphysical understanding post life. So, the whole idea of post life, what happens after life, do you go to hell, etc. Those thoughts are being sidelined in favor of the immediate reality, the immediate lived reality, which is the embodied reality, the reality available to us through our senses, through our embodied engagements, uh, through our affective engagements in the world around. And that affective embodied quality is something which is constantly foregrounded. And hence very sensuous quality about the narrative, which was also a shock uh, given the time in which it was written. Okay, uh, Martin Cunningham emerged from a side path talking gravely. Solicitor, I think, uh, I know this, I know his face, Menton, John Henry, Solicitor, Commissioner for Oaths and Affidavits. Dignam used to be in this office, Matt Dillon's long ago, Jolly Matt. Uh, convivial in, uh, evenings, cold fowl, cigars, uh, tantalus glasses, heart of gold really. Yes, Menton got his rag out in the evening or the bowling green because I sailed inside him. Pure fluke in mind, the bias. Why took such a roasted dislike to me? Hate at first sight. Molly and Floyd Dillon linked under the uh, li lily tree, laughing. Fellow always like that, mortified if women are by. Okay. Got a dinge in the side of his heart, carriage properly. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Bloom said beside him. They stopped. Your hat is a little crushed, Mr. Bloom is points at pointing. John Henry Menton stared at him for an instant without moving. 
There, Martin Cunningham held, pointing old sir, John Henry Manton took off his hat, bulged out a dinge and smeared the cap, the nap, with K on his coat sleeve. He, sh he clapped the hat on his head again. It's all right now, Martin, John Ma Martin Cunningham said. John Henry Manton jerked his head down in acknowledgement. Thank you, he said shortly. They walked on towards the gates. Mr. Bleem, chap fallen, drew behind a few paces uh, so as not to overhear. Martin laying down the low. Uh, Martin could wind a sappy head like that round his little finger without us seeing it. Oysterize, never mind. Be sorry after perhaps when it dawns on him. Get a pull over for him over him that, that way. Thank you. How grand we are this morning. So the entire conversation over here again looks uh, look at the transitions that are being made over here between the banal, someone have a, someone having a crushed hat, to the profound and political and metaphysical in quality, which is these borderlands are very, very blurry throughout Ulysses. Okay, and now we come to this point where the entire image of Ireland comes up in a very interesting and political way. And we get to see Bloom's um, you know, ignorance about the country, the fact that it's never really seen the country except of Dublin. And this is what is on your screen at the moment. Strange and never saw his real country, Ireland, my country, member for College Green. He boomed that worked a uh, worker attacked for all it was worth. It's the ads and side features seller weekly, not a, sale, not, not a stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead, published with authority in the year 1000. And, um, uh, Demis is situated in the townland of uh, Rosnalis, barony of uh, Tenhenge. To all whom it may concern, schedule uh, a pursuant to statute uh, showing return of numbers of meals and genets exported from Belena. Nature notes, cartoons, Phil Blake's weekly part in Bull Story, Uncle Toby's page for tiny tots, uh, country pumpkins queries, little dear Mr. Editor, what is a good cure? For flutulence, uh, I like that part, learn a lot, teaching others, the personal lot, MAP, play mainly old pictures, shapely brothers on, on, on Golden Strand, world's biggest balloon, double marriage of sisters celebrated, two bridegrooms laughing hurtly at each other, Cooper in a room, printer, more Irish than the Irish. So you have a series of different kind of random images over here, which are obviously different kinds of advertisements uh, in newspapers. Uh, and you know, the whole idea of advertisement, the fact that Bloom is so close to the advertisement industry in, 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 in Dublin is quite symbolic because the whole idea of advertisement is to disseminate science. Uh, that's the whole purpose of advertisement, to so stylize science, to disseminate science, to control science, S-I-G-N-S, science. So the science system uh, is being stylized through advertisements and you know, the whole idea of you know, being an insult to the advertisement makes uh, it's, it's like a hyperlink text because so, an entire novel use can be seen as an advertisement for different kinds of thought processes, right? So the fact that Bloom is an, is an ad man or very close to the ad industry is striking because that obviously makes them someone who's controlling narratives, someone who is in charge of controlling narratives, someone who is obviously uh, aware of the control of narratives that advertisement industry wields, okay? Uh, the machines clanked in three, four times, thump, thump, thump. Now, if you got paralyzed there and no, no one knew how to stop them, they clank on and the same, printed over and over, up and back, uh, monkey doodle the whole thing, want a cool head, right? So again, the whole idea, the automatism of printing is, uh, is celebrated away, the automatism of production is celebrated away, yeah. And that's how the entire advertisement industry works. So, and everything has been printed and disseminated and spectacularly dished out. Well, get it into the evening uh, ed edition, Councillor, I said, soon, be, soon by, be calling him my Lord Mayor. Long John is backing him, they say. The film man, without answering, scribbled press on a corner of the street and made a sign to the typesetter. He handed uh, the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen. Right, thanks, I said, moving off. Mr. Bloom, student's way, if you want to draw the cashier is just going to lunch, he said, pointing backward with his thumb. Did you? Haynes asked. Him, Mr. Bloom said, look sharp and you'll catch him. Thanks, old man, Haynes said, and I'll tap him too. Uh, he hurried on eagerly towards the Freeman's journal. Tree Barber lent him in Magus, three weeks, third hint. So, you know, you can find that in Ulysses, there's a lot of money lending which takes place, and that's obviously very symbolic in quality. People owe each other uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, you know gratitudes, different kinds of uh, helps. And this non-repayment of money is obviously quite symbolic in Ulysses because it's part of the gaps in Ulysses, the gaps in communication, the crisis of communication, the gaps in positions, the gaps in human relationships. That's obviously being uh, conveyed to us very symbolically because this flow of money which is not never really returned. So we have Buck Milligan who owes money from uh, Stephen Didalis. Uh, Didalis owes money from Buck Milligan. The milkwoman owes money from everyone. And over here, Bloom and Heinz uh, 
they, it is a lack of this, uh, you know, lending of money and the non return of money here as well. And that's obviously quite symbolic in quality. That obviously makes it the entire subtext of crisis of communication even more poignant in quality. Okay, now we have this image of Bloom going out on the streets and walking through Dublin, which obviously becomes very cinematic in quality. We talked about the relationship between modernism and cinema already uh, quite often. And the, the person that I recommend that you should read is someone called David Trotter. It's got a book called Modernism and Cinema, published by Blackwell. It's a really interesting book and very helpful as well. Now here we have Bloom passing out and, and walking down the streets of Dublin. Mr. Bloom passed out out of the clanking noises through the gallery onto the landings. Now I'm going to tram it out all the way and then catch him out perhaps. Better, phone him out first. Number, yes, same as, as, as Crit Citron's house, 28, 28 double fill. Once, once more than so, only once more than so. Once more that so. He went down the, st the house staircase. Who the deuce crawl all over these walls with matches? Looks as if they did it for a bet. Heavy, greasy smell. There always is in his works. Lukewarm glue and thumbs next to when I was there. So again, the sense becomes important over here. The entire olfactory expressions, olfactory experiences become important because that obviously helps him navigate uh, through his surroundings. He took out his handkerchief to dab his nose. Uh, Citroen lemon, oh the soap I put there, lose it out of the pocket, put him back his handkerchief, he took out a soap and stored it away, buttoned in the hip pocket of his trousers. Now obviously the uh, soap metaphor becomes useful because obviously that's a cleansing metaphor, something which is used to clean things uh, and obviously that becomes an inadequate form of cleaning because Dublin is so dirty and, 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 and so you know, gritty and so unclean. So it so becomes the metaphor of the attempt to clean Dublin, the attempt to be hygienic, which obviously belies the spectacular lack of hygiene that people have in Dublin, which is being dramatized over here by Joyce. Okay, so what perfume does your wife use? I could go home still, tram, something I forgot, just to say before dressing. No, here, no. A sudden screech of laughter came from the evening telegraph office. Know who that is? What's up? Pop in a uh, minute to your phone. Ned Lambert it is. He entered softly. Erin, green gem on the silver sea. The ghost walks professor, Michael murmured softly, biscuitfully to the dusty window pane. Mr. Dallas, staring from the empty fireplace at Ned Lambert's quizzing face, uh, asked of it sourly, agonizing Christ, wouldn't give you a hard bun on your ass. Ned Lambert sit on the table read on over again, know the meanderings of some purling rill as it babbles in the way, though quarrelling with the stony obstacles, to the tumbling waters of Neptune's blue domain, amid mossy banks fanned by gentlest sapphires, played on by the glorious sunlight, or net the shadows cast over his pensive bosom by the overarching leafage of the giants of the forest. What about that, Simon? He asked with the fringe of his newspaper, how is that for high? Now again, look at the way in which language is used in Ulysses. So language over here is never an innocent performance. It isn't performance in the first place. It's very performative. It's not really a passive category. It's a performative category. Now also language is used to you know, correspond to certain emotional registers, uh, emotional intellectual registers. So certain kind of languages are used deliberately, uh, stylized systems of signification uh, to convey certain emotions. And that's why, again, I go back to my previous point, the advertising agency becomes a very symbolic presence in Ulysses. Because the entire culture, the entire business of advertisement is a controlled science. Uh, the science system has been controlled, stylized, navigated, played with. Uh, and the playfulness of science is something which advertisements uh, have historically always done uh, in stylizing certain things. And that becomes uh, very much part of the main narrative, the nested narrative of Ulysses as well. Okay, um, and then of course the whole relationship of drinking and, and language is uh, mentioned in some details. Okay. Uh, and then uh, consumption, the whole act of consumption comes back. Uh, he, he ate off uh, uh, the crescent, this is uh, Professor Maku. He ate off the crescent of water biscuit he had been nibbling and hungered, made ready to nibble the biscuit in his other hand. High phalaton stuff, blood bags, Ned Lambert is taking a day off, a sea, rather upsets a man's day, a funeral does. He has influence, they say, old Chatterton, the vice chancellor, it is, it is his grand uncle or his great grand uncle, close to 90, they say, sub leader of his death, written this long time perhaps, living to spite them, might go first himself. Johnny, make room for your, for, for your uncle, the right honorable Hedges I Chatterton. Dare say he writes him an old shaky shake or two on gale days, windfall when he kicks out, Alleluia. So again, human relationships uh, are very mercenary in Ulysses, as you can see. 
Uh, so the whole idea of this very influential great grand uncle uh, is being parodied over here and there's a way for a windfall to happen when he uh, kicks out, when he passes out, so he passes away, right? So the, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a spectral quality about money, the spectral quality about uh, human beings, in there's also human relationships, something shadowy, spectral and not quite solid. And the lack of tangible uh, quality, the intangibility as it were, the intangible quality of human relationships in Ulysses is something that is foregrounded over and over again. The entire city becomes a city of uh, spectrality, the entire city becomes a city of you know, unreal human relationships. And if you can see, if you make a comparison with this uh, image from Elliot's Wasteland, it talks about unreal city and the you know, brown fog of a winter town. Something similar happens in Dublin as well. It's very unhygienic away, it's very dirty away, it's full of gritty realism and human relationships always uh, uh, stylized and, and very, very spectral in quality and you know, the very ungenuine in quality. Right, and that becomes part of the, the crisis in, in, in Dublin, the cultural crisis, the communication crisis is very much a part of the system, this crisis of communication that is the main crisis at play. Okay, and now we have again uh, the human beings navigation through machines and movements and sounds which are mechanical in quality and again the organic inorganic combination is something which Joyce is uh, playing up very, very subtly and complexly. And this should be on the screen. The bell whirred again as it rang off. He came in quickly and bumped against uh, Lenahan who was struggling up with a second tissue. Pardon was here, uh, you know, Lenahan said, clutching him for an instant and making a grimace. My fault, Mr. Bloom said, suffering his grip. Are you hurt? I'm in a hurry. Knee, Lenahan said. He made a comic face and whined, rubbing his knee. The accumulation of the anno domini. Uh, sorry, Mr. Bloom, uh, Mr. Bloom said. So again, look at the way in which anno domini or after Christ, or the pain of Christ, uh, is being used in a very flippant way over here. The accumulation of the anno domini is obviously the reference to suffering and that happens when two people run into each other and one of them hurts the other person's knee. Uh, something so minor and trivial has been you know, described in very metaphysical terms. He went to the door and holding it ajar post, J.J. O'Malloy slapped the heavy pages over. The noise of two shrill voices, a mouth organ echoed in the bare hallway from the newsboys squatted on the doorsteps. We are the boys from Wexford who fought with heart and, and, and land and hand, exit Bloom. I'm just running around to Bachelor's Walk, Mr. Bloom said about this out of case, want to fix it up. Uh, they tell me he's around here in Dillon's. Now, if you take a look at this bit, exit Bloom, this is normally used in theater productions when, you know, some, it's been told to us that someone exits the scene, uh, someone who goes away from the scene, etc. Now, obviously, the exit Bloom away is something which Bloom tells himself in his head and that becomes a very interesting symbol because obviously, as you've seen, uh, in many occasions, uh, there's a constant uh, conversation that Bloom is having in his head or Dallas is having in his head, which may or may not be aligned to the conversations around him. So, we have two different kinds of combinations or conversations. One is the embedded conversation that characters have in their heads and the other of course is the extended conversations they have with other people, other human subjects around them. And it's constant uh, commingling as it were between the embedded order of conversation and the external order of conversation is something which Ulysses does very, very often. So, there are different focal points in the novel which makes it such a cognitively complex novel to grasp with because there isn't a single focal point to which the entire story unfolds. So, there are multiple focal points, even the same character can have different focal points, uh, which makes it very difficult for us to cognitively grapple with what is happening in Ulysses. Okay, right. He looked uh, indecisively for a moment at the faces. The editor who leaned against the mantel shelf had propped his head on his hand, suddenly stretched forth an arm amply. Be gone, he said, the world is before you. Back in our time, Mr. Bloom said, hurrying out. J.J. Omanali or Omalai took the tissues from Lenahan's hand and read them, blowing them apart gently without comment. He'll get an advertisement, the professor said, staring through those uh, black-rimmed spectacles over the cross-blind. Look at the young scams after him. Show sure, where, Lenahan cried, run into the window. A street cottage, both smiled over the cross-blind and the fly file of capering newsboys in Mr. Bloom's wake, the last uh, zigzagging white on the breeze of mocking kite, a tale of white burnouts. Look at the young Gutterstam behind him, hue and cry, uh, Lenahan said, and you'll kick all my rib risable, taking off his flat spokes and the, and the walk, small, small lines, steel upon locks. Uh, he began to mazooka and swift caricature towards the flow on sliding feet past the fireplace and J.J. Umuloy uh, who places tissues in his receiving hands. What's that? Miles Crawford said with a start. Where are the other two gone? Who the professor said turning. They've gone round to the over for a drink. Perhaps Hooper is there with Jack Hall. Come over last night. Came over last night. Come on then, Miles Crawford said. Where's my hat? He walked jerkily to, to, into the office behind 
hotting the vent of his jacket, jingling his keys in his back pocket, the jingle then in the air and against the wood as he locked his dress desk dryer. So you can look at the uh, movements over here and there are very casual conversations and going to a pub and getting drunk uh, and then of course the human movements happening uh, together but also look at the way in which different, different micro sounds and micro movements take place, the jingle of a key inside a pocket. Uh, and it's very intensification of something very minor and micro is something which is uh, done over and over again in Ulysses which gives a sense of magnification of small things which is quite cinematic in quality in its own way. Okay, now uh, it is a very interesting conversation and I'll end with this point today. It's a very interesting conversation about the nature and function and the death of civilizations which is something which we saw already in Heart of Darkness when obviously Marlowe comes back and talks about how this place in London and River Thames was once too a dark place in the world and now he's been to Congo which is like uh, you know, prehistoric London to a certain extent. Uh, so the whole entire idea of civilization and modernism is a very complex thing. Uh, it is d definitely something which is transitional in quality, something which is mutable in quality and the acceptance of the mutability of civilization is something which is painful as well as uh, liberating on certain occasions. Now the reference to Roman civilization was is brought up over here. Uh, you know, Imperium Romanum, J. J. Omalai said gently, it, so, it sounded nobler than British or Brixton. The word reminds of somehow uh, somehow of fat in the fire. Miles Crawford blew his first puff violently towards the ceiling. That's it, he said. We are the fat. You and I are the fat in the fire. We haven't got a chance of a snowball in hell. The grandeur that was Rome. Wait a moment, Professor McHugh said, rising, uh, raising to quite close. We mustn't be led away by words, by sounds of words. We think of Rome imperial, imperious, imperative. He extended uh, allocation with arms with, from frayed, strained shirt cuffs, posing. What was a civilization? Fast, uh, loud, but vile. Uh, Cloquet, serious. The Jews in the wilderness and on the mountaintop said, it is, meet, it is meet to be here. Let us build an altar to Jehovah. The Roman, like the Englishman who follows in his footsteps, brought to every new show on which he set his foot. On our show, he never set it, only his cloakal obsession. He gazed about him in his toga and said, it is meet to be here. Let us construct a water closet. Now, obviously, this is a parody of English uh, imperialism, but it's interesting how the English imperialism is seen as a legacy as a continuation of the Roman imperialism, how both became this white man's uh, imperial narratives and that's something which is highlighted here. Which they accordingly did so, Lenehan said, our old an an ancestral or ancient ancestors as we read that in the first chapter of Genesis were partial to the running stream. They were nature's gentlemen, J.J. Omoloi murmured, but we ha have also Roman law and Pontus Pilate uh, is a Prophet, uh, Professor McHugh responded. Do you know the story that Chief Baron Pellis, J. J. Omulai asked? It was uh, at a Royal University dinner. Everything was going swimmingly. First, my riddle, Lenihan said, Are you ready? Uh, Mr. Om Omadan Burke, uh, tall in a uh, copious grey of Donegal tweed, came in from the hallway. Stephen to Dallas behind him, uncovered as he entered. Uh, and then, of course, they asked to come in, the friends come in, uh, you know, is being summoned by Lenihan. I escort a suppliant, Mr. O. Madden Burke said melodiously, youth led by experience visits notoriety. How did you? The editor said, holding out a hand, come in, your governor is just gone. Lenihan said to all, silence, what opera resemblance a railway line, reflect, ponder, excogate, reply. Stephen handed over the type sheets, pointing to the style and signature. Who? The editor asked, bit torn off, Mr. Garrett Deasy, Stephen said. That old Pelta, the editor said, who tore it? Was he shot taken? Again, the reference to Garrett, Garrett, Garrett Deasy is interesting because he's the one who has a conversation with Stephen about this Jewishness and how Jewishness is obviously a marker of corruption and degeneration. If you remember one of your earlier lectures in Ulysses, how that extensively. And obviously, he sent someone to be published to the editor. True, Stephen. Okay, hey, good day, Stephen, the, the, the professor said, coming to peer over the shoulders, foot and mouth, are you turned? A uh, bullock befriending Bard, a shindy in well known restaurant. Good day, sir, Stephen answered, blushing. The letter is not mine, but Mr. Garrett asked me to. Oh, I know him, uh, Garrett Deasy, I know him, Miles, Miles Crawford said, and I knew his wife too, the bloodiest old Tata God ever made. By Jesus, she had a foot and mouth disease, and no mistake, the night she threw the soup in the waiter's face and the star and got her at home. A woman brought sin into the world for Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus, ten years of Greece, or Ruki, Prince of Brefini. Is he a widower? Stephen asks. I, a grass one, Miles Crawford said, his eye running down the typescript. Emperor's houses, Habsburg, an Irishman saved his life on the ramparts of Vienna. Don't you forget, 
Maximin and Karl Odenel, Graf von uh, Turkunel in Ireland, sent his heir over to make the king on Austrian field marshal now. Going to be trouble there one day. Wild geese. Oh yes, every time. Don't you forget that. The mute point is that he forgot it. J.J. Omolai said quietly, turning a horseshoe paperweight. Saving princes is a thank you job. Professor McHugh turned on him, and if not, he said, I'll tell you how it is. Miles Crawford began, a Hungarian, it was one day. And then there, was, uh, there are different kinds of quotations done about different historical moments. Now, what we see over here, the entire conversation, the reason why I'm reading out these things in some details, is a half chopped quality of the conversations. And none of these together, uh, none of these individually make any sense, but they all come together as half chopped conversations, and they all become some kind of advertisement rhetoric where the catchy words are being said to us, uh, these, the decisive words are being said to us, and the catchiness of phrases is something which is being projected over and over again by the different people, the different voices who speak together over here. Which brings us to the original point that we talked about that Ulysses being a very heteroglossic and polyphonic novel. There are so many different kinds of voices, spectral voices voices, dead voices, human voices, uh, voices from the past, voices from the present, voices looking forward to the future and of course the gramophone, uh, the sound recorder, the machine to record sounds become a very important metaphor of this voice, the hyper voice quality about Ulysses. Everything can be recorded in gramophone which can then churn out these voices over and over again. So I stop at this point today, but I think the heteroglossia and the polyphonia of Ulysses and also the carnivalist quality of Ulysses, where you know different kinds of things such as death, mortality, uh, profundity, mysticism, epiphany, they are all talked about in very machinic, uh, almost flippant terms which give a dark comic quality to this novel. It is something which we must pay some attention to as we move on. So from this point onwards, we look at certain very selected passages in Ulysses and we'll wind up in maybe a couple of more lectures, or maybe three more lectures in the times to come. So I will stop at this point today, I will continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.